This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So this week, uh, I'll do the first of uh, the discussions about uh, how do we get to where we get to. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I, it's a kind of always an interesting question of uh, where, where to begin. And uh, of course, the classic answer, well, you, you begin at the beginning. Well, I could go back to the Italian city-states and all the rest, as I mentioned last time. But I'm going to start, actually, uh, with the post-war period, uh, 1945, and to look at the situation both in the United States and to some degree globally uh, during this period from you know, 1945 to the 1970 or so. Now, in 1945, <clears throat> you've had a disruption, a serious disruption in the global economy, uh, which was World War II. There was a great deal of damage which was involved in, uh, in, in, in that great deal of destruction. Uh, a great deal of reparation is, requi is required. Uh, and uh, there had been, as most people understood and was well understood, uh, the crisis of the 1930s, which was uh, very serious and, and a serious depression. And it had introduced a whole set of new economic policies uh, orchestrated through the New Deal. So we have a New Deal politics and we have uh, uh, that all in charge. Now, the situation in World War II was rather complicated for the United States. To begin with, you needed to, to have a mass mobilization of the productive capacity of the United States to produce the guns and the aircraft and the ships and the, all the material you needed uh, to fight the war. So there had been an incredible increase in productive capacity of the US economy. And there was a, therefore a real, very real issue as to how that productive capacity could be utilized for peacetime purposes uh, after 1945. Uh, and the recognition that the real problem, which was generally understood, and I'll, I'll cut corners and accept it, but the, the biggest problem of the 1930s was lack of effective demand. There was not enough demand in the economy. And the more people got unemployed, the less demand there was, and as there was less and less demand, so, you know, industry closed down and that had been the problem. The downward spiral of the 1930s had effectively been reversed partly by Roosevelt's uh, New Deal policies, but he always had, you know, the austerity hawks jumping all over him and saying well, too much state intervention and all the rest of it. And he gave in to them in 1938. And, you know, U.S. went back into a mini recession, but really saved the U.S. economy uh, from the recession was, of course, uh, World War II. And World War II, like I said, huge increase in, pr in productive capacity. Second thing about it was World War II took a lot of men, uh, active men, and put them in the armed services. And so they had gone off to fight the war, and they had fought this war against fascism. And they had uh, fought it specifically against uh, a, a rival, against a uh, a political power that was based on anti-Semitism. So there's, there's that situation. The second problem for the United States was this, that it had um, found itself in alliance with uh, the Soviet Union. Now, there are all sorts of to tales told, of course, about who won World War II, and the United States story is, of course, that the U.S. won World War II. Well, in certain respects, it did. But the big, big fight was with the Soviet Union. And it was Stalingrad and the destruction of a large segment of the, of the German army through the campaign in the Soviet, against the Soviets that, that, that was really there. So the Soviets were uh, very, very important allies in World War II. Um, arguably, uh, 
the West would not have been able to defeat it. Uh, Germany and Japan without Soviet support. And Soviet support was therefore crucial. So there, there you have the uh, United States, which has commandeered a large segment of the economy and it's kind of almost like centralized planning. And again, if you say centralized planning cannot work, uh, if you really, if this, the state really puts their mind to it and all the corporate heads were summoned to Washington and they organized uh, the whole economy more or less along the central planning lines, uh, which, which horrified them, but which nevertheless uh, worked uh, very well in, in some ways. Uh, the mini version of that right now is if the federal government really decides to do something competently, like confront the COVID virus, it, it can do so. And, and when it does so, it can do so very effectively. So it was that in, in World War II, the United States organized its production capacity very effectively more or less along centralized planning lines and requisitioning lines and the corporations were collaborating rather than competing uh, and so and 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 you were in an alliance with the 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 the, the, the dreaded soviets so you what you have then is a kind of uh, uh, all of that and then you've got the problem of a large demobilized uh, services the demob so coming coming back to the United States and what were they going to face? What kinds of uh, world were they going to come back for? If they went off giving their lives and their blood and their sweat and all the rest of it to this big, you know, huge fight, and they came back and they came back into a world of unemployment of the sort that had been there in the 1930s, uh, and uh, corporations which were kind of uh, helplessly sitting around a banking system that was kind of deeply corrupt. If they came back to all of that, um, almost certainly uh, you would have a mess on your hands, if not a revolution on, on your hands. So the big question for the United States was what, what, what to do, what to do, how to, how to resolve this real serious problem of potential mass unemployment of a demobilized military uh, apparatus, how also to deal with the fact that during World War II, given that the number of men taken into the armed forces was so large, um, you had a, 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 a revival, if you like, of employment for marginalized, hitherto marginalized populations. Um, there was the famous story of Rosie the Riveter, and, and more women were participating in the labor force in World War II. And the marginalized black population, which was still heavily in the South in the 1930s, but started was drifting north, uh, came very, very fast so that uh, the steel mills and the auto plant and all the rest of it uh, was increasingly going to find a labor force which uh, covered the marginalized populations and that you would find, therefore, women, uh, African-Americans and others in, in the mix. Now, the, the, there's a situation. Now, now I, I, I can just sort of tell a story, if you like, which, which, which is going to skip over but make it sound like, well, okay, this is a simple story. In fact, it was very, very complicated. But trade unions had become very active during World War II. There was, were there some not, notable strike activity during World War II, uh, which had to be settled very much on labor's terms because the labor was scarce and labor was not, uh, you know, so, so there was, there was a, a lot more activism. And yeah, therefore you get uh, a situation in 1945, which is facing, <clears throat> Uh, the powers that be, call it that for a moment. The big, the big banks in particular, although they had a very bad reputation uh, given what had happened in the 1930s for the large corporations, Henry Ford and you know the, 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 all the big General Motors and all the rest of it, U.S. Steel, so on. All of those big corporations were sort of there and uh, they, they had to think about, well, well how on earth uh, were they going to handle this uh, situation? I don't know what the discussions were like. I'm sure if you went back, you would never see things openly discussed, but certain things arose which seemed to help 
satisfy the situation. The first and perhaps most important thing, and this began to be felt uh, in, even, even in 1942, 43, was anti-communism. Now, <clears throat> the New Deal had been pretty open uh, to all sorts of uh, different political people of all sorts of different political persuasions, uh, democratic, social democratic, uh, socialist, and so on. And some of the New Deal measures, such as natural resources, planning board, and so on, were, were actually, uh, you know, very consistent with, uh, with communist uh, thinking. So that, uh, and the Communist Party was active, and it was certainly active uh, in, in, in the South, it was active in terms of uh, anti-racism and so on. And while there was a lot of discontent with the with the with the Europe party, it was it was there, and there was there was a significant uh, political edge there. But that political edge was something which I think the major corporations started to see was very very uh, dangerous to them, and they started to see it as a threat, particularly since the Soviets were allies. So you start to see the anti-communism building up in, 1940, in the mid-1940s and the House Un-American Activities Committee started to sort of go after communist influence in the, uh, in the unions and elsewhere. And of course, we then get McCarthyism. Now, McCarthyism was an authoritarian system. It was an authoritarian system that kind of said, if you were caught even talking to a communist, you were under suspicion. And a whole set of uh, people were attacked in the unions, in government, and in academia, and the law, and all the rest of it, for communist sympathies. sympathies. And in many instances, people who kind of even negotiated and talked with, with communists, because they had to, were, were, were held under suspicion. So one of the classic kind of moves that an authoritarian state makes is repression. Repression of uh, uh, opposite ideologies. This was classically what uh, Louis Bonaparte did in France and back in so, sort of when he came to power in 1848 and he declared himself emperor in, uh, in, in 1852. And one of the things he did was to set up a secret service which actually listened in on people and they started to go after anybody with communist sympathies, anybody with anti anti-imperial uh, sympath sympathies. And so the, the, the police force and the, and the surveillance uh, became really very strong and the informers, the network of informers became very strong. So that uh, in this period, uh, in the ethnic communities, I, I, I tried to talk to some of the people in the Polish community uh, in Baltimore, and this is in the so 1970s, about McCarthyism, and they just didn't want to talk about it. And in the end, I got to somebody who said, well, you've got to understand why they won't talk about it, because the Polish uh, organization was, was, was divided, fiercely divided, between the sort of Catholic tradition, which is sort of anti-communist, and those who, who had, had you know, experience in the unions and part of the union organization and were, were pro-communist. So when, when Poland went communist uh, with the Soviet occupation, uh, this divided uh, the ethnic communities and people were informing upon each other. And it was very ugly and it was very nasty. And, you know, we look at the divisions going on in families right now over Trump. Well, that sort of thing was going on in the ethnic communities over the, the, the pro and anti-communist. And a lot of the grassroots communism was organized through the Catholic Church. There was a Catholic preacher who was very significant in this in the United States. So the anti-communism ideologically became significant. Uh, People in universities were, were made, in some instances, to, to swear a loyalty oath. Some people refused on principle, and in which case they lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their, their positions in, in major institutions. Some of the private institution, in educational institutions at that time did not follow suit. But there was a great deal of persecution which, which went on. 
I, I became familiar with that very strongly with the case of, uh, uh, of a scholar of, uh, on, on uh, China and uh, Central Asia, uh, Owen Lattimore. Uh, and uh, McCarthy, at some point or other, fingered Owen Lattimore as being one of the top three Soviet agents in advisory position to the State Department. And this became a fierce kind of question after the Chinese Revolution and Mao came to power. Uh, there was a big debate in the United States about who lost China and who was soft on China. And anybody who was, uh, was under suspicion, and Owen Lattimore kept his job at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, but was essentially marginalized, totally marginalized, and in the end, uh, just, and couldn't get published anywhere, by the way, uh, and in the end, uh, out of frustration, uh, went to, took a job in, in Britain, uh, where McCarthyism of a sort was in, in, in there, but nowhere near as fierce or as strong. So the first aim then, uh, uh, which is the Bonapartist strategy, is repress your opposition. Do it ruthlessly, do it by, you know, Ruthless, ruthless form of repression. But if it's just ruthless repression and you're not doing anything in terms of the economy, you're not going to go anywhere. And Louis Bonaparte realized so in 1852 when he declared the empire, he brought Haussmann to Paris and said, rebuild Paris, he said, which created a vast amount of employment. And, there, and, and then he, he did something else which was interesting which is, he says, oh, okay, um, uh, we're going to change the court demeanor and all the uniforms in the court and everything so that all the seamstresses in Paris were busy sort of making new uniforms and new everything. I mean, it's, this, it's the kind of thing that he did. He created, um, he created employment. He created employment by uh, re, you know, rebuilding the city. He created employment uh, affecting the culture. And, you know, you look at all those pictures and the... Uh, and, the uh, uh, impressionists of the people uh, being entertained, so they created a kind of nightlife and uh, all the rest of it, you know, it was a kind of consumerist society. So, you know, on the one hand you repress, on the other hand you open up to all of this kind of, all this kind of stuff. So that was very, uh, that's a very important kind of wing. So what, what was the United States going to do? Well, there are two answers, I think. First was the Cold War. The Cold War meant immediately that, it, you know, the armament sector became one of the ways of absorbing the surplus productive capacity of the, Amer of the American industry that had developed in World War II. In other words, in other words, you continued what would happen in World War II, but now you're doing it in, 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 but in order to do that, you need an enemy. And of course, the enemy conveniently was the Soviet Union. So that collided also with the necessity to rep repress socialists uh, uh, internally and anybody with socialist sympathies internally, you would do that. But at the same time, uh, you would uh, therefore push uh, uh, again to uh, follow the Soviet uh, uh, anti-Soviet strategy in terms of military expenditures. But so that you get a kind of uh, a military rescue passage, of mili what sometimes we call military Keynesianism, which is a sort of deficit financing of military uh, in order to deal with a particular kind of threat. Now, the military loved it, of course, and the military was getting empowered by it, and the military enjoyed it. The military became very sophisticated at the, uh, uh, in, in sort of inventing uh, threats, uh, and at some time or other, there was a missile gap, and then there was another gap, and then there has to be, you know, then that, and when they set up the first Sputnik, that created another, you know, that, that created another kind of big, big fuss. So he, the military side of things and, 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 and the security side of things became very, very, very strong, and this is one of the ways in which surplus productive capacity was absorbed. Employment was uh, sort of set up so that, a lot of the uh, defense industries, which uh, were set up in California and the American South and so on, started to flourish very well in terms of military contracts and all the rest of it. So that was, that was one, of the, one, one part of the problem. But it was only one part of the problem. The other part of the problem was, can you launch uh, a program of consumerism of some sort? 
which is going to keep the working classes and the working classes who are coming back from having fought against fascism, is there a way that they can, st they can be employed in terms of producing consumer goods which they themselves can consume in some ways? Well, the answer was, well, yes, there was an answer to that. And it had a lot to do with uh, the consumerism which was associated with suburbanization. You started to build, and you'd already seen elements of this in the 1930s, you started to build highways, you started to build uh, settlements uh, like uh, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the large settlements uh, of suburban uh, sort. So the, you, you suburbanized. You changed the nature of urbanization. And the change of the nature of urbanization required that uh, people live a certain lifestyle. In other words, the whole lifestyle starts to change around a suburban lifestyle, which involved you know, the car. It involved working people having enough money to buy a car. It involved them having enough to buy a house. It involved them having enough uh, to buy all the things that you fill the houses with, you know, all of the consumer durables and, and, and so on. So these are, these, this is the sort of thing uh, that, uh, that, that started to. But in order for this to happen, you have to have people with the income stream who are able to afford this. I mean, you could build all the suburbs, but if nobody had any money and they couldn't afford a mortgage and they couldn't afford a car, yeah, it was, it was pointless. So one of the things that then happened was that you started to actually treat certain segments of the working class in a very positive way. And you get something emerging by the end of the 1960s, people are talking about in terms of something called the affluent worker. And the affluent worker was typically one who was working for automobile, steel, or whatever, who was getting a, a pretty good union protected wage. And uh, the wage contracts were good and, and, and uh, possible, and, 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 and so you get uh, a consumerist set. And by the way, in addition, the returning GIs had a GI bill, which would give them education on a GI Bill that would help them to housing ownership and the, joining the American dream. This is where the, the, the theory and the ideology of the American dream came from. And it's not as if all Americans had this dream from day one of the colonization, but it was promoted in the, 19, in the, in the 1950s and 1960s, and it was promoted as, as, as a lifestyle, a culture style. Watch all the sitcoms of that period. I Love Lucy, The Brady Bunch, and all those kind of things. And what you'll see is a a fascinating kind of depiction of, of suburban lifestyle. And this is a suburban lifestyle that is suddenly made accessible to each other visually through television, and then financially by unionized contracts and, 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 and adequate wages. So there's the solution. Communism is being repressed on the one hand, all ideology of the left are being repressed on the one hand, on the other hand, you've got an economic development model which is based on expansion, accumulation of capital, and it's also understood that there should be adequate wage rates and ad adequate wage determination. Now, this was uh, the, 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 the situation in period from 1945 to around 1970. But you see immediately that that solution had, if you like, certain problems in it. To begin with, in terms of the workforce, did you find that there was a, a division uh, in the working class between those with secure and reasonably affluent uh, employment conditions, uh, which were generally employed in the, in the mega corporations. Uh, and uh, this time there was a distinction made by this Marxist economist called Jim O'Connor between uh, what he called the competitive sector and the monopoly sector. In the monopoly sector, you could afford to pay reasonably good wages and get a, your wage contracts and all those certain unionization and all the rest of it. And this was effectively a very white configuration, very white. And so you get the affluent worker, you know, suburban lifestyle uh, with an automobile, all the rest of it. The competitive sector is left behind in cities, is not suburbanizing, 
it's occupying cities and it's marginalized populations. It's a lot of it African American. And, and of course, women uh, were being pushed back out of the labor force in the period after World War II because uh, they were competing with the men, but then you start to find more and more women entering in the labor force. And so you find yourself in the 1960s mm -hmm. in a situation where a marginalized population, watching television and seeing that lifestyle, is living a life which has nothing whatsoever to do with that lifestyle, is living in conditions which are absolutely uh, appalling compared to the, you know, wonderful kind of daily life in, 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 in the newly built suburbs. So here's that situation. But at that situation then finds itself uh, in, encompassing rapid growth and shortages of labor, scarcities of labor. Two things happened in the 1960s which were absolutely critical. The first thing was the Civil Rights Act, which started to outlaw discrimination in employment and discrimination in housing and discrimination in all these things. Didn't entirely elaborate, uh, do what it was supposed to do, but nevertheless, it was very important. And LBJ, President Johnson, when he signed that, said, this is going to deliver the Southern vote to the Republican Party for the next generation. Well, he was wrong. It was delivered Republicans in the Southern states for more than one generation. It was more or less two, three generations. So 1965, but was a political break point, which was important, which was that the Roosevelt coalition had been built upon Southern Dixiecrats, that is segregationist Southerners, plus Northern liberals. That, that was the core of the Democratic Party, unionized liberals in the North and Southern Dixiecrats. And that continued uh, on, on, you know, until, uh, well, well, into the 1990s, actually, to be significant as a, as a, 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 a legacy of that. But from then on, the, the South was not going to be Democratic. The South was going to be more and more Republican around racial segregation and racial, the racial tensions, and it was very racialized compared uh, to the North, which was also racialized, but in a very, very different kind of way. So during the 1960s, you have all of these uprisings. Uh, we have an urban crisis. And it's interesting, there was not a general crisis of capital, there was an urban crisis. And the urban crisis was impacted, marginalized African-American population blocked into the city where they had very, very limited employment opportunities. But certain numbers of them were actually able to get into the monopoly sector. So that you find some, in Bethlehem Steel, for example, you'll find some, some black people, some Puerto Ricans and so on, who are beginning to be employed. And after a settlement in 1984, uh, uh, there was an agreement that a certain number of women would be permitted to come into. To, so you start to see uh, a, a slum, some difference along those lines. But then that was emphasized by something which is absolutely critically important. That is, all the major corporations in the 1960s in particular found themselves suffering from the problem of scarcity of labor. They didn't have enough labor. And scarcity of labor meant they had to start to pay higher wages and better were contracts. And so what seemed like a kind of, con in, a, in a way, a paternalistic concession to the workers in 1945 in terms of better contracts, by the time you get to the mid-1960s, what you're talking about is a situation where the working class is quite powerful because of the scarcity of labor. Uh, and the, what the Civil Rights Act did was to say, well, actually, the labor can start to flow more freely into the monopoly sector. That was one of the consequences. Labor can actually start to, uh, you know, black labor can start to imagine living in a suburb. In fact, that didn't really happen, but very much. But it, it was, it was altogether, it was theoretically possible. But there was another reform in 1965, which is absolutely crucial to this story. And that reform was the reform of the immigration laws. And up until 1965, immigration from Europe would be based on a quota system. You know, the Italians had plenty of slots because, you know, historically they'd been very important. 
uh, British people, Germans and the like. So it was it was based essentially on on giving priority to those immigrant groups which had come into the country in the 19th century. So the, 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 the quota system was very, very important. And what that did was to hold, say that, you know, people from Latin America can't come in. People from the Caribbean can't come in. People from Asia, hard to get in. So in the 1960s, that was the situation. But in 1965, all of that quota system was, was abolished. And that of abolition meant that the United States was basically saying it was open to bring in new labor resources from all around the world, no matter what their color or what their, their problem. This was, I think, a very significant moment. And it was a very significant moment that was shared across the capitalist world. Scarcities of labor were everywhere being felt. And, and, and it's astonishing now when you, when, you, when, when you read about it, that in the 1960s, West Germany, as it then was, was subsidizing the import of Turkish labor. It was bringing in Turks and encouraging the Turks to come in and labor. The French were subsidizing the import of North African labor, the Maghrebians, as they were called, from Algeria, Tunisia, and all the rest of it. Uh, the Swedes were bringing in from Yugoslavia and from Portugal. The British uh, were opening up to the British Empire and saying, basically, you know, we need you. In fact, immigration was seen by the corporations as one of the key means by which you could undermine working class power. And therefore, there was a broad support amongst the corporate capital for immigration policies that were relatively open and which would uh, allow uh, a challenge to be made through immigration to working class power. And this, I think, was kind of a, a major, major feature connected with the Civil Rights Act. What that did in this country was very, very simple. It introduced the idea that big labor and, in fact, the power of labor in general was, could be undermined by in the import of labor. And that imported labor could be of any color, any provenance. In other words, you had to open yourself up to that. The same was true in Europe. What this did was to actually boost a long history of anti-immigrant anti -immigrant feeling. It was this moment which led to all sorts of shifts going on. And it was the moment when the white working class was feeling threatened by immigrant labor of different color and the like. Now, then this issue of immigration started to become significant. To the degree that we are still faced with these problems of immigration, they have their roots, and this is where the long durée comes in, they have their roots. Back in the 1960s, when immigration was used by corporate capital, to undercut the power of the working class, as it was then constituted. So you've got this relatively strong working class, which is white-led, which is now being threatened by the mass of workers being introduced from all over the world. And the United States has historically been remarkably open. Uh, when I got my citizenship, I think it was in about year 2000, I went to this big mass sort of induction and you know, citizenship signing in Baltimore. And it was, it was remarkable because it was only, you know, there were about four or 500 people in this one ceremony. And uh, I think it was probably 10 or maybe 20 people there who were most visibly white. I was in a very, very small minority. Now, this was Baltimore, of course, but, but uh, it gives you, gives you an idea that the United States was very open on this log. And, and, and of course, what that meant was that the anti-immigrant politics started to become a very significant strain. But the anti-immigrant politics these days is always thought of as a cultural question. 
Whereas back then, it clearly had its roots, clearly had its roots as a labor question. And, and that labor question side of it is very, very significant and continues to be significant and continues to be used. But it's, you know, and you find this being used very, very strongly in many European countries. And it caused some radical shifts in political allegiances. For instance, a significant number of white workers left the Communist Party in France to join the National Front. And in exactly the same way, uh, you will also find in Britain, <clears throat> there's a famous speech given by real right-winger neo-fascist Enoch Powell, who, took, who really talked up anti-immigration uh, end of the 1960s, early 1970s, and he said, if you continue this policy of having open borders, we're going to live in a, in a country where rivers of blood will fly all over the place. It was very, 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 very violent, anti-immigrant. Uh, and, and of course, it, by then, it could also be anti-Semitic. It was difficult to be anti-Semitic in 1945, but by the time you get to 1970, uh, yeah, you could, you could start to be play, play that that card too. So this is, this is the, 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 the sort of situation. The long durée perspective says capital was surviving and developing in the way it was in part through repression of left-wing ideologies and any left-wing thinking, educational system that was pinned down, and a, an economic development model which was about the formation of a certain kind of lifestyle to which privileged workers could accede. And bit by bit, those privileged workers themselves found themselves, if you like, isolated. Now, nobody writes too much these days about the affluent worker anymore. That's all sort of disappeared. That's one of the victories of neoliberalism. It's democratized uh, impoverishment uh, to, to some degree. But the, the, the period of the 1960s was, was a very distinctive period. Now, this distinctive period also has its geopolitical uh, form. It's geopolitical in the following kind of way. that the United States recognized that one of the big problems of the 1930s and the Versailles settlement was the visitation of uh, debt repayment on the part of the defeated countries. This was a disaster and turned out to be a disaster. So what we had after World War II was the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan said, we can actually rebuild much of what's going on in the world and we'll provide the resources to it. Because in a sense, to the degree that the 1930s had been characterized by a lack of effective demand, if you rebuild the economies of Japan, you rebuild the current economy of Europe, what you're doing is in the rebuilding is you generate demand and you have more demand. So that the lack of demand which was there in the 1930s is being taken over by big internal investment in the interstate highway system and the suburban building and the urbanization and all the rest of it. It's being taken over by the, uh, by the military expenditures and the militarization. It's also being taken over by the demand from other countries for, for your product. So that therefore other countries, because they are developing, are developing demand and therefore, and, and there's an interesting kind of way in which, uh, for instance, Marx talks about this. He said, kind of says, well, you know, the interesting thing, he talks about it in individual terms, but you can also talk about it in, 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 in national terms. He said, every capitalist individual wants to hold their wage down as low as they possibly can because that is where their profit comes from and they can maximize their profit that way. On the other hand, every capitalist hopes all the other capitalists will pay their work as well because they are the ones who are going to buy your product. So this is, if you like, a dilemma. Now, the same thing goes on with, with countries. That if I keep the wage rate low where I am, then I'm not going to, you know, provide much demand for, for, for somebody else. If they keep their wage rate, rate low, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to find the, the, my ability to, to market to them. So geopolitically, there was an understanding, and this is where the Keynesian thinking comes in, is very strong, that what the state should do should 
debt finance increasing development and through this increasing development you then absorb the surplus capacity and you provide the employment and you get this incredible dynamism and this incredible dynamism translated in this period from 1945 to around 1970 or so into a rate of growth globally which was around four percent and the united states was growing like gangbusters during this period okay there were periods of, of disruption there was an urban crisis and people were burning things down and all the rest of it was, was in the cities and, and there was a huge kind of outburst of that in, in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King in uh, 1968. So this is, this is, this is one of the big uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of ways. So the globally, you start to see this global system uh, emerging. And here you get another hint of what global politics is going to be about. The top dog, the hegemonic power, put in Arigi's terms, the hegemonic power is always asking and demanding open trade and open trade relations, free trade. You know, this is what the Manchester industrialists in Marx's time wanted. That's, they, they were the free traders. The free traders all wanted, were the, were the top manufacturing interests. They wanted to create a free trade world. And, and, and to some degree, they did so. In 1945, the United States really took command of the global economy and said, we're going to have an open world. <laughs> we're going to have a single oil market, a single market in commodities and all the rest of it. We're going to have um, general agreement on tariffs and trade. We're going to try and reduce barriers between trade between countries, which ends up in the WTO and the World Trade Organization much, much later. But the whole politics was around opening up. But that opening up during this period, up until 1970, this opening up was constrained in the following kind of way. That Bretton Woods Agreement set up a situation in which all the currencies of the world were orchestrated together and tied together with the US dollar being the global currency. And the US dollar was anchored by a promise to pay the dollar in gold. Gold was $35 an ounce, and therefore US dollars could be converted into gold at that level. Now, what this meant was that every country, particularly the, 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 the larger countries, was going to be in control of its own fiscal and monetary policy, with the exception that they had a fixed exchange rate against US dollar. To devalue was a disaster, and if you devalued it had to be signaled and you couldn't just devalue on a daily basis. But up until 1971, there was a fixed exchange rates in the world economy. And that meant that each country had, was in a sense, in charge of its own self. So in the United States, for example, it made sense to talk about the US working class, because the state was the entity within which you mobilized. And if you could gain power, some political power, through influence over the Democratic Party and all the rest of it, that was, be, that was, that was something where you could get social wage increased by Medicare and all those sorts of things. So that's important. So the social wage then started to shift country to country. Each country had its working class. Each country had its economy. Each country had its fiscal policies and its particular way of doing things. And so, in a sense, there were all of these class struggles going on within countries. But, but there was very little way in which the working class of Detroit was going to be put in competition with the working class uh, in Germany or the working class in Japan. There was no, no way that, that could really easily happen. So, what you find is a closed set of systems in which politics is orchestrated. That is, there is no way in which this is breaking, is going to break down without there being a breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. Well, the Bretton Woods system did break down. And it broke down in 1971, 15th of August, 1971. Mark that date. That was the day in which Nixon said, we have gone off the gold standard. We're no longer going to agree that you can trade us uh, dollars for an ounce of gold for $35.
now we've, that's all over. And after that, we had floating exchange rates, the protections which existed of one country against another through different fiscal policy, policies and currency regimes and so on, all disappeared, which is a different kind of world. So the world that was constructed in 1945 through the Bretton Woods agreements of this kind, through these policies of expansion of demand, through debt financing of the suburbs and then debt financing to some degree of the reconstruction of the Japanese and German and European economies and, and all the rest of it. These, these, this sort of thing was something which was very specific to that period and it created the contradictions which emerged in the 1970s and which led to a very significant shift in, in, in the politics of the 1970s and we'll talk about that uh, next time. So let me leave it there. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.